for those of you who don't know what the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics is, um, it's a, a big organization uh, all across Switzerland um, with different groups doing surveys or research um, for bio to federate bioinformatics um, in, in across Switzerland. And so we are, uh, the CALIFO group is a, is a joint group between the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics and the University of Geneva. And uh, we developed NextProd since 2011. So where is NextProd? What is this concept of uh, a human, a, a, a database dedicated on human proteins? So we, we had this idea uh, 10 years ago to create this specific database uh, on top of Swiss prot entries. So for those of you who are not very familiar with Uniprot, Swiss prot, Maxprot, and all this landscape of protein databases, let me just explain you exactly the difference between all these prot things. So you probably all heard about Uniprot, and Uniprot is a very, very big database on proteins from all organisms. And the current release of Uniprot has about 200 million of, se of sequences from half a million species. From this very, very big corpus of sequences, some are manually reviewed. And uh, now, um, so, so this manual reviewing is done on a restricted set of species and a restricted set of genes within those species. And in the current release of Uniprot, there are half a million of manually reviewed sequences which, um, which are available. And from these half a million manually reviewed entries, there are 20,000 entries for human genes. And in those entries in SwissProt, you find manually corrected and manually reviewed sequences and lots of biological, biologically relevant information, such as the function of the protein, um, different features of the sequence, the presence of domains, of, pro of post-translational modifications, and so on. This information is extracted from the literature and also obtained by applying a number of sequence analysis tools on the sequences. But there are also a lot of other information on human proteins that is available on different resources. And the goal of NextProt was to add this information that was not in the Swiss prot entries and that was available in different resources at genomic level, transcriptomic level, proteomic level, protein-protein interactions, and so on and so forth. So 10 years ago, we, we decided to take this very small subset of Swiss prot, which is human protein entries, and add all what we could find in those entries and create really um, an integrated database on human proteins. So at present, we, we integrate, uh, our main focus is, sorry, our main focuses are uh, variant annotations and we integrate a lot of different um, polymorphism um, data from uh, DBSNP and Genomedi and lots of um, information about somatic mutations that appear in cancers and that come from the COSMIC database. We also add uh, information about the expression of genes in different tissues, and both at the mRNA level and at protein level. So it's antibody-based data, mainly. We add some information about protein-protein interactions, and mainly from two sources, the intact database, and also a new set that was um, uh, that we integrated from NU Pharma, a company, a friend, based company. Um, and we also have a strong focus on mass spectrometry data and we integrate a lot of um, data from proteomics repositories such as Massive or Peptide Atlas 
to uh, integrate information about peptide identification attached to the proteins. So all this information comes uh, in, in next part. So just as a disclaimer, um, so because we build Nextplot on Swissplot, we depend, our sequences are exactly the same that the one that you find in Swissplot. We don't have more sequences than Swissplot. We just add more information on the same sequences. And Swissplot and Nextplot are considered to be complete in terms of human genome because they contain at least one uh, one sequence, one representative sequence per known human gene. And in each entry, you, you find at least one of those sequences and sometimes other splice isoforms. But it can happen that other isoforms exist and, and are in Uniprot, but not in the Swiss prot reviewed part, but in Tremble. So these entries, you don't find them in SwissProt and you won't find them in NextProt. So if you are interested in having, a, having all the sequences described for human, then you have to turn to the very large corpus of Uniprot human sequences. NextProt only guarantees uh, the, the reviewed sequences from SwissProt. So in the, in the current release of NextProt, um, we have 20,353 entries, exactly the same number as SwissProt. And uh, as you can see um, in this uh, diagram, because we focus strictly on one species, which is human, we can have a coverage that is bigger than the one, larger than the one from SwissProt in terms of protein-protein interactions, expression data, peptide data, and so on, that is not uh, annotated in switch parts. So we are more complete for human proteins than uh, what you can find in Swiss parts. And so for example, we have um, uh, nearly uh, 1 billion different variants annotated in next part. Um, we have um, uh, nearly 200,000 um, protein uh, post translational modifications annotated. And we have uh, two and a half million um, peptide ident identifications associated to human proteins that are annotated in export. So uh, it's a fairly um, big um, uh, um, export offers a very big uh, uh, data set um, on, on human proteins. So Nextprot is has entries like SwissProt uh, and the, the identifier, Nextprot identifiers in fact are the same than the SwissProt ones and we just add NX before the SwissProt identifier. And for each of the entry, uh, we have different views depending on what is your, uh, your interest in the, in the protein. And for each protein, for example, you have a function view, and then you have different views, medical, expression, interactions, localization, sequence, etc. And the, those views are displayed in the left menu, and you can uh, change the views depending on the information that you are look, looking uh, for. So here I, I, um, I show a screenshot of the function view of thyroidoxin, human thyroidoxin. And in this function view, you will find the summary of the function of the protein that is done by Swiss procurators. And after the summary, you have a, a list of Go, an, Go annotations that come from a variety of sources uh, and that, um, that give uh, for each annotation the, the meta, associated metadata, provenance, and evidence of this annotation. In the sequence view, we have um, the, the sequence view allows you to, to tell, for example, for a particular protein, what variants are known, what protein post-translational modifications were described, and those variants and those PTMs, are they located in functional domains, are they affecting active sites, and so on. So we build this sequence view in a, in a, 
interactive viewer where you, you find the sequence and all the annotations, the, the positional annotations related to the sequence that are displayed in the upper part of the viewer. And then if you click on one of the features of interest, you, you can see it in the lower part of the, of the view, of the viewer. And in this table, in the lower part of the viewer, you have all the metadata associated to a particular positional annotation. And it's dynamically linked. And when you click either in the table or in the, in the sequence um, display, then it highlights also the, the residue or the, or the selected sequence on the sequence that is displayed at the right side of the screen. So the sequence view offers a dynamic representation of all positional annotations and gives uh, a lot of annotated metadata associated to the data that is presented for the positional annotations. And in addition, you have a search functionality in the feature uh, viewer here in which, for example, you can find, you can, you can look for a particular uh, genome ID variant or a PTM or oops, any positional annotation. And that will um, uh, direct you to the line in the feature viewer that corresponds to your query. And once you are in the line corresponding to your query, you, you have a link to the resource providing this annotation. And you have, of course, the details of the annotation. We also have an interaction, a, a view um, dedicated to protein-protein interactions. And in that view, you can find uh, which parts of your protein of interest mediate interactions with other proteins. So this is, for example, uh, the interaction view of uh, the, the HIP1 protein. And in this view, you can see with a similar um, uh, screen, uh, the, a similar display than for the sequence view, you see the sequence of the protein and you see the domains that support the interaction with other proteins. And like for the sequence view, you can navigate between those different viewers. We also have a, a view dedicated to the 3D structure of the protein. And in this view, you can, for example, look if a particular variant will be externally accessible or on the contrary, internal to the structure of the protein. So exactly like for the sequence view, you can select any positional annotation on the sequence viewer that will be highlighted on the feature table. And then below, you find a, a viewer of three-dimensional structure, and you can highlight any position of interest on any 3D structure that is linked to the protein. We also have uh, a view um, to, to look at the expression of the different genes, both at mRNA level and at protein level. Uh, with data coming from BG, which is another resource from SIB, and from the Human Protein Atlas, which is a, a, a resource um, giving data both at mRNA level by RNA-seq and a lot of antibody-based data. So we, we have put all this information in a single table that allows to compare the data at both mRNA level and protein levels for any um, tissue of interest. So as an important note for those of you who are developers, our sequence viewer, feature viewer, and the, the hierarchical heat map table that is used for the expression view are all uh, JavaScript components and can be freely reused uh, if you are interested. And uh, we show source code and examples in our GitHub repository. Um, if you, you are a programmer and you want to retrieve Maxpot contents, you can also use our API. And um, so in the, in the Maxpot website, uh, we, we have this API with a help for, to how to use it. But basically you can retrieve any part of the entry of interest uh, quite in, a, in a quite easy way 
and I encourage you to, to have a look and try and to join for the specific breakout, uh, to the specific hands-on breakout session that will take place uh, later this afternoon uh, on the API. Well, because NextProt has uh, a lot of information specific to human proteins, um, it uh, has been uh, selected as the reference knowledge base for the human protein project of the Human Proteome Organization, HUPO. Um, so for those of you who don't know about this project, it's a project that was uh, launched exactly 10 years ago uh, at, at this uh, on the 23rd of September, uh, 10 years ago, and uh, whose mission is to use mass spectrometry to validate all the predicted human genes. Um, and uh, so it federates uh, about more than 1,000 researchers worldwide, and each team tries to, to have really a credible identification for all the human genes. And because NextProt is the reference knowledge base for this project, it has to integrate all the data coming from this project, provide dedicated viewers and tools for this data, provide some export format that, are, that can be used for, uh, by mass spectrometry researchers, and monitor the progress of the project and provide annual metrics. And one of the hands-on session will be specifically um, dedicated to proteomics data and tools in NextProt. So as I mentioned before, the, um, one of the important goals of this project is to validate the existence of all the human genes by mass spectrometry. And to, to validate those proteins, uh, the first thing was to establish some criteria of validation of those proteins. And iteration after iteration, the HPP decided that one entry, one protein, was validate, was told, um, was upgraded as a validated by mass spectrometry if at least two unique peptides that are non-nested um, are, are reported in, by one uh, major repository. So what um, our, our role in NextProt is to integrate all the data that comes from the community at large and by HPP investigators in particular, who all submit their data individually to different mass spectrometry repositories. Then this data is reanalyzed by the major um, uh, global mass spectrometry databases that are peptide atlas and MASI, and that guarantee that the peptide identifications uh, are of good quality. And then we, we as NextProt, as a final resource for this project, we integrate all the peptides that have been validated by peptide and uh, we count if at least two of those peptides map to a particular protein and come from a single resource, either peptide atlas or MASI. And if yes, then the protein is called validated at protein level and, um, uh, and, and is validated. NextProt also integrates data from another major partner of the HUPO HPP project, which, which is the Human Protein Atlas. But at the moment, Antibody-based data that is integrated in, in NextProt is not used to validate the existence of protein because of potential problems of uh, antibody specificity. But we are thinking on how to also use antibody-based data to validate the existence of human proteins. So once we have integrated all this data, uh, we compute uh, a score of validation of the protein, and all the proteins that have been confidently identified have a score of what we call PE1, and we have other scores for protein not having uh, sufficient credible evidence for their existence, 
and we have a complicated system of P2, P3, P4 categories for proteins that we that have good evidence that they should exist but have not been validated at protein level. And we also have a specific category which is called PE5 for entries for which we doubt that they really are protein coding and that probably correspond to pseudogenes or other elements of the genome that are not real, that we don't think are real proteins. And based on all these counts and all these scores attributed to each protein, every year we uh, estimate the number of proteins which still have to be tracked and validated by mass spectrometry. And in the last releases of NextPlot, there are still about 10% of the human protein which completely lacks uh, any identification at protein level. So all this proteomics data that comes either from HPP researchers or for, from any other the mass spectrometry labs um, are integrated and are displayed in a uh, dedicated view that it's called the proteomics view. So in this view, it's, it's, it's built with the same uh, principle than the sequence view. And in that view, you can find which peptides for a given protein have been found and in which tissue or which cell line. You can find if, if oh, there is an antibody available for this protein um, uh, and, and data available at the Human Protein Atlas. And we also integrate uh, da um, data from SRM Atlas, which is a, an atlas of synthetic peptides. And because of that, you can um, immediately see uh, what peptides you can use if you want to do some targeted proteomics studies. So all those identified peptides are represented here on the, on the sequence view. And uh, you can, as for the sequence view, you can select any of them and have the details of the identification of the provenance of the quality um, of your peptide of interest. Um, one important thing um, uh, about those peptides are that we, we have to check that a mapping of one peptide to a protein is unique to, unique to this protein or can be found in other proteins. Because that's a strong criteria to be sure that those peptides can be used to validate the existence of the protein. So for each of the peptides that are reported for an entry, we report if they are uniquely mapping to this protein or not uniquely mapping to this protein. And of course, we describe where the, the peptides have been identified. And if we have link to repositories where they have been found, we provide those links and then you can access directly to the spectra or to more technical details on the uh, peptide identification. So as I just mentioned, one important aspect of uh, peptide uh, data integration in NextPlot is to validate the uniqueness of those, pep of those matches from peptides to proteins. And to do that, we developed a specific tool that is called the NextPlot Peptide Uniqueness Checker that we use internally to check the uniqueness of all the peptides that we integrate, but also that we also uh, propose to, um, for the community to use to analyze their own list of identified peptides within a proteomics experiment. So the tool is accessible on the NextPlot website. And basically it works as follows. So you first enter your list of peptides or you upload a file with all your peptides. You launch the, the query and then you will, for each of your peptides, you will see if it is uniquely mapping to an entry or um, if there are additional mappings, both if you want to consider all the variants, the genomic variants known and described in NextPlot, or without taking polymorphisms into account. You have two choices. 
And, uh, and so, for example, here, the second peptide is uniquely mapping to this entry when you don't take into account variants. But if you take into account all the variants that are known and described in Nextplot, this peptide loses its uniqueness. And of course, you have other peptides that map to a number of entries. And uh, even if you don't take into account any polymorphism, it will map to plenty of entries. And of course, these results can be downloaded. You, have a, you, can, you can have them in an Excel format, uh, and which is more convenient than, um, than looking at the results on, uh, on, the, on, on this viewer. We also developed another tool that may be of interest for the proteomicians is the Nextplot Protein Digestion tool. Uh, so that works um, to uh, when you, you really want to focus on a particular protein and you want to get to, to, to design a specific experiment to identify this protein. And you want to select the proper enzyme to use for your mass spectrometry study. So in that case, you, you, you just query for your protein of interest. You um, give the length of the peptide that you want to, to, to get at the end of the cleavage. And then um, the, 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 the tool will uh, perform a series of theoretical digestions with different enzymes and will provide you with the counts of peptides and the uniqueness of those peptides. So you can predict if a given protein will work with a classical trypsin-based experiment, or if you have to turn to another enzyme um, to, to be sure that at the end you will get unique peptides and you can validate your identifications. So this tool is also available in the Nextplot platform. So now we have seen how to look at uh, data um, uh, for one given entry. Um, but another thing that is uh, really useful to do with Nextplot is to search for information, for global information, and, and not only to start with one single entry. And there are different ways to, to search for information in Nextplot. The very simple one is uh, the simple search in Nextplot, which is a Google-like uh, search in which you can search for proteins, of course, but you can also search for publications, for all the publications that were used to annotate data that is found in Nextplot. And you can also search for terms that, are, that have been used in Nextplot. Uh, so that, that's quite large as a query. Uh, but it's not super precise. You cannot do really a combination of different queries. You cannot look for a particular, for proteins in a particular context and so on. It's really like Google. So the, here I put an example. If you look for liver in the terms that, that are loaded in Nextplot, you, you see that you have a number of terms uh, that uh, cover, of course, the anatomy. Uh, but also some phenotypes or um, some go terms, uh, etc. So that's quite convenient if you want to do a quick search. But that's not, in, in most cases, it's not really as precise as desired. So this is why we designed um, advanced tools, really to make precise queries in Nextplot. And those tools are based on a technology that is an, on a language that is called Sparkle. Sparkle is a semantic query language that is able to retrieve and manipulate data that is stored in a format that is called RDF. So without uh, going into a lot of details, a RDF data model is based on statements that are known as triples and that are that have a subject, a predicate, and an object. So for example, the sky has the color blue. And we will detail that a, a, a bit more in the, in the practicals after this lecture. 
So the next plot, next plot has a RDF based model. Of course, it's a bit more complicated than the sky has the color blue. And our RDF data model looks like that. So in fact, for each of the next plot entry, you have different splice isoforms and all the annotations uh, of expressions, subcellular location, interactions, all the positional annotations are linked, are attached to each of the isoforms present in the entry. So our model is isoform centric. And for each isoform, you have a, a wide variety of annotations. And for each of these annotations, we don't use free text because it's not really standardized and interoperable, but we use controlled vocabularies as much as possible and uh, different terms and different ontologies that also are available uh, on our FTP site. And uh, we try to document for each of our annotation to document always the quality of the, of the annotation, the provenance and the detection method and, and all the metadata that we can capture to allow a full traceability of all our annotations. And, and so our Sparkle based tools make use of this very rich data model um, and allow really to go far into exploration on Nextcloud data. So Sparkle queries uh, always consist of variables at the beginning. Then you have the query per se, and in some cases you can modify uh, the query using some uh, modifiers. And so they, they look uh, like that. This is a, the one very simple Sparkle query where I am asking for all the proteins phosphorylated and located in the cytoplasm. This query cannot be done with a simple search, so you have to turn to the advanced search. And the query is quite simple. You want entries where at least one isoform, because all the annotations are linked to the isoform, are phosphorylated. So we'll have this keyword here, which, which is the keyword associated with all, with all phosphorylations, and will be located in the cytoplasm. And uh, or any subpart of the cytoplasm and in uh, Sparkle that is written like that. So I completely um, understand that it's when you don't know about Sparkle, it's quite difficult to write this kind of query. So um, we have um, pre-made different queries that you can find on the Nextpot website and that help the user to, um, to write their own queries. So in the advanced search of Nextprod, you have this, uh, this interface, uh, which allows to retrieve lists of protein entries with Sparkle queries. Uh, here is an example on how to look for those proteins uh, missing evidence of detection at protein level. And you, you see that you can immediately get the, the complete list of them in one query. And as I mentioned before, uh, to help, there is a, a pre-made list of queries available. But we also developed an even more advanced mode of query uh, of Nextpot, which is called Snorkel. And in that particular tool, you, you can not only retrieve lists of proteins, but you can retrieve absolutely any data that is in Nextplot. Uh, not only proteins, but all but uh, variants or uh, families or any any item that you are interested in and that is in Nextplot. And uh, for example, you can retrieve all the variants that have a frequency of more than 0.1 and that will affect PTM sites. So the queries are uh, generally a little more complex. And uh, you, you have the results uh, in, in different formats, but for example, as a table here. And here, with this example of the frequent variants that affect known PTM sites, you have immediately your list of results 
showing that, for example, here, this protein has uh, a glycosylation here and at the same position, a variant from N to S with a very high frequency. So that's super convenient to retrieve um, complex uh, sets of data from Nextprot in a, in a format that, that is completely uh, up to you because you, in the variables of your query, you can ask for absolutely any item that is in Nextprot. And also for the snorkel, we have made some queries and we display them and we encourage people to use them and to customize them uh, depending on their interest. And we just published a tutorial on how to use these different Sparkle tools to retrieve data in it. And of course, we also have a detailed help on the different RDF entities that are in Nextprot and that help to write Sparkle queries. Nextprot contains a lot of things, but does not contain everything on human proteins. I mentioned that it contains mass spectrometry data, antibody-based data, RNA sequencing data, PTMs, variants, protein-protein interactions, functional annotations, which is already a lot. But it does not have any information about phylogenetic information, about data on model organisms, about pharmacology data, about clinical proteogenomic data, about structural data itself, or about interactions with pathogens, and, and lots of other things. But the beauty of Sparkle-based tools is that in one query, you, you can not only query the content of the resource that you are querying at the moment you are querying, but you can, you can write queries that federate this, the corpus of data of one resource with other re resources that are semantically compatible. And that is called federated Sparkle queries. And we already worked with a, a number of uh, resources that have a Sparkle endpoint and that are semantically compatible with Nextprot. And in one query, you can really um, query both in the protein world um, and, for example, in the small molecule world or um, in the pathway resources uh, and so on. And we have wrote, written lots of examples of such very powerful federated queries. And we, uh, from time to time, we, we publish them uh, in our website as examples. And we encourage people to, to give us ideas on, what, on queries and on, how, on resources to federate with Nextprot. And uh, among the last queries that, were, that we released, we published some queries, for example, related to coronaviruses. And, uh, and you can find uh, here uh, proteins involved in, uh, in co coronaviruses pathways that have medical information from other repositories or that have drug information from other repositories uh, and so on. Um, last but not least, Nextprot uh, integrates its own data, federates its data with other resources. Uh, Nextprot also provides their tools for the community, such as the Protomix tools. But Nextprot also wants to host tools that are developed by the community. And uh, for, uh, um, in the current uh, release, we have two tools that are completely developed by third parties. And we just create links between Nextport and those tools. And we allow our users to seamlessly um, navigate between Nextport and these other tools. And those community tools can be found in the left menu at the bottom uh, of, uh, of each entry. And if you are a developer and you have a tool and you want to, to and you would like to distribute it through Nextprot, then just contact us. It's quite easy to plug any tool to Nextprot. Um, so don't hesitate to, to come and, and talk to us. So with that, uh, I'm, I think I've gone to a pretty uh, wide tour of uh, Nextprot functionalities. And I wanted to thank my colleagues uh, from the, the Geneva group, 
uh, Amos Bayrock, who, who is co-directing the group with me, uh, Paula Dweck, who is a bio curator in the team, guaranteeing that uh, all the controlled vocabularies are properly used and uh, that all the, the data is, um, uh, so, so she, she's uh, de um, deciding all the, the thresholds of quality for all the, the data that is integrated in, uh, in Nextprot. Uh, we have a wonderful team of uh, developers, Pierre-André Michel, Vin Vincenzo da Ponte, Alain Gatto, Valentine Reche de Laval, and Kazuli Samarasunde. And Monique San, who will be with me for the practicals and who guarantees the overall quality of the resource and uh, who is really keen on answering feedback from the users. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Thanks a lot. Um, you know, a big applause for you. Uh, <laughs> before we go on with the questions, please, you can use the chat to put your questions. You can also take the microphone and ask directly also that to, to Lindsay or use the Google Doc that you have received also. But before we go into that, I would like to launch a poll to ask you three questions, if you can answer your, the questions that you see on your screen, why you, that will be wonderful. It's three quick questions. And in the meanwhile, while you, you are going through that, um, let's open then the chat or the microphones for your questions to Lydie. Any questions? Don't be shy. Okay, there's one short question. Yes, on the chat. Please go ahead, or you can also put your microphone on. Hey, on. As you wish. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh yeah, uh, I have a short question on the um, the criteria of a uh, uh, missing fourteen. Is uh, um, is uh, you you said uh, a single single source. single source? You said a single source of samples. Well, what does it mean? The single source is uh, um, I ah, think yes. uh, yeah, a man or. Uh, a well, man is a single source or uh, a data set. I mean, a single source. Can no, you explain? In, yeah, more? yeah. In fact, uh, um, all the data that is submitted to individually to uh, to the the different mass spectrometry repositories are reanalyzed either by Pepad Atlas and by Messi. And uh, the HPP decided to. Um, validate a protein if we can find two peptides for a single sequence that come either from peptide atlas or from massive but you cannot have one peptide from peptide atlas and one peptide from massive that does not work because the the false discovery rate would be too high for that so i don't know if 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 it's clear, but it's uh, it's not that the two peptides have to be to be found in the exact same individual study, but no, but it has to be found in, in the same global reanalysis of all the mass spectrometry data that is submitted at a at a given time. Either so you you mean the uh, single source mean the uh, in single data set, right? In a single big data set coming from the reanalysis of all the data sets. All the data set. Okay. So what times? In individual data set. No, um, all the individual data sets are put in a global pot, and then ah. that last reanalyzes all those data sets with a pipeline, and Massive does the same 
with a bit different uh, individual data sets. And each oh, okay. received from Peptide Atlas one very big data set. And we received from Massive another very big data set. Uh, yeah, yeah. To qualify, a protein has to have two peptides, either from Peptide Atlas or from Massive, yeah. but not one from each. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's another question also from Ana Garcia Martin. Thank you for the lecture, really great. I wonder if in a short period of time, next prot will also compile information regarding bacterial proteins. Oh, that's not in our plans, but that would be very interesting. Uh, so no, next prot is really built to focus on human proteins. And uh, we don't have, uh, at least in the, in the midterm future, we don't have any plan to capture information on bacterial proteins. But what, would we, what we would like to do would be to have information on which human proteins can um, bind bacterial proteins and to have information about protein-protein interactions between human and any kind of bacteria. But we don't want to be a, a, a database focusing, uh, we, don't want, we don't have the resource to, to accommodate and to annotate uh, bacterial proteins at the moment. Thank you very much. There's another question now from Francesco Varato. How many researchers do you think or know use the Nextplot platform currently? And how many from the EPFL? Ah, good question. Um, how many researchers? So in the, in the past years, we have focused a lot on the proteomics community. Um, and so I know that nearly all uh, the HPP investigators use Nextprot because they're they also because they are required to use it to report their results and that means more than one one thousand people have have to use Nextprot and, and I hope are happy with uh, with what we propose. Then we have also some users um, um, interested in a, um, a rare disease variant uh, in, in Europe, because we are part of a network of, uh, of teams uh, working on rare disease uh, genome annotations. Um, but it's, it's less than the proteomission users. And then specifically how many users from the EPFL, I have no clue, but uh, I could check the logs, maybe. Or I, I would be happy to hear if any, if any EPFL uh, lab is using us and uh, and would like to have, uh, yeah, to, to, to and, and would have specific questions or specific uh, fields of interest that we, we could help. Yeah. If we have anyone on the call from EPFL, they can put that on the chat already. Yeah. So I next question, question from Echeverri. Amazing overview and amazing integration of massive information. I have a question regarding PTM mapping, PTM's mapping. I just went through some proteins and saw mainly more, only mapping of phospho phosphopeptides. What is the evidence necessary to map other types of less common modifications like carbonylation or any other PTMs? Yeah, so we, so we have different sources of PTM information in Nextprot. So for phosphorylation, we rely on the phosphopeptides that are analyzed by Peptide Atlas. So we receive them in one very big data set every two years or every year, depending on the peptide atlas. We have for the some modifications that need to be to be studied really at the level of one protein and that are not amenable to mass spectrometry study. Um, we rely on the Swiss prot uh, annotations and we integrate all the the PTMs annotated by Swiss prot. And in between, for for all the other um, uh, so for glycosylation, we integrate information from Glyconnect, which is another resource from, from SIB, and which annotates glycosylation from, um, based on different techniques, mass spectrometry, but not only mass spectrometry. And for, for other modifications like ubiquitination or um, acetylation and so on, we have uh, our own uh, annotation, uh, annotation from mass spectrometry data. And so we, we take papers and we have our uh, criteria to, to integrate this information. And so you can find ubiquitin insights, uh, 
methylation sites, acetylation sites from a number of studies. But now we, so, so we used to do that a lot in the past. And uh, now that the team is a bit reduced, we don't have sufficient resource to, to cope with, uh, with all the new studies coming with new large scale PTM uh, annotations. So we, ha we are currently trying to find solutions to, to overcome that and to, to be really up to date with, uh, with all the PTM information, which are non phospho But uh, yeah, we, we are thinking, uh, we, we, are, we want to collaborate also maybe with uh, Peptide Atlas for uh, other um, PTM uh, annotations. We, we will see. But we, for, at the moment, we have three or four different sources of, uh, of PTMs, not only for school. Thank you very much. From David Lyon, do you collect data on peptide protein abundances and how do you integrate data from various sources and experiments? Not yet. We don't, uh, we don't have any data on uh, quantitative proteomics yet. Um, it is something that, uh, that is also under uh, reflection. And uh, I would be happy to, to have uh, inputs on people uh, involved in that field to, to know how to integrate different uh, abundance, different results of different abundances for the same tissue. Uh, Etc. It's 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 not trivial to integrate this kind of uh, results, but it's definitely very interesting to do. It's it's in our plan, but we don't know yet when we will be able to, to have that. Thank you, Liji. From uh, Jit Bora, in terms of da data, what annotations and, da and data are completely unique to Nextprot compared to Uniprot? Um, Compared to Uniprot, in, in Uniprot you don't have um, mass spectrometry data integrated, so all the peptides are, uh, are not found in Uniprot. Um, the expression data, um, the details of expression data is not found in, uh, in Uniprot. Um, the phosphorylation sites from Peptide Atlas and the one and the PTM sites that we integ we annotated based on proteomics papers are not in Uniprot. Um, protein, the, the last big data set of protein-protein interactions from Enio Pharma uh, is specific to Nextprot and not in Uniprot. Um, maybe there are other things um, that uh, do not come to my mind just now, but uh, there are a number of things that are not in, uh, in Swissprot. Thank you very much. Another question from Chia Wei. For peptide uniqueness checker, what does it check exactly? Does it check the sequence peptide uniqueness to the whole human proteomic database or only isomers? And how often does Nextprot update? Every three months or so? Uh, so uh, the, the uniqueness checker checks at, uh, peptide sequence against all the sequences that are in Nextprot. So that means all the isoform sequences that are described in Nextprot, which are the same than the ones that are in Swissprot. That does not check the uniqueness of sequences against all possible human proteins that are in Trendel and, uh, and that are not been manually reviewed and, and integrated in Swissprot and Nextprot. So it's within, it checks within the, the Nextprot view of the human proteome, but it checks, it takes into account all the variations that have, that have been annotated. So all the polymorphisms, all the somatic mutations and so on, um, uh, so, so are, are taken into account. So that means that if a peptide, uh, if, if you have a variant that will change the sequence um, and, and that the peptide would match the sequence if it has this variation, then uh, the uniqueness checker is able to, to, to detect that, uh, this event. So, so it, it can never be complete, complete because uh, there are always new sequences uh, coming and so on. And so, uh, we cannot guarantee that we have all the, the human sequences existing and reported, but we, we do our best to to have a representative human carefully uh, manually reviewed data set. 
And for the second question about the updates of Nextprod, so we try to, to have at least two major updates per year, and in some years we manage to have three. So it's a bit less frequently updated than Swiss prod, Uniprod, that makes an update every two months. Thank you very much. Another question from Espoir Kabanga. Thank you for the clear presentation. Does Nextprod use any deep machine learning for or artificial intelligence algorithms in either of its options or tools? Like for instance, in the peptide uniqueness checker? No, we don't. Um, it's, uh, the, the peptide uniqueness checker is not, uh, does not use this kind of, uh, of algorithms. And, uh, but we are not against developing such tools, but uh, we don't have any use case yet where we thought it would be uh, relevant. But I'm open to any suggestion and any collaboration in that field because uh, I think there are plenty of things to do. Thank you. From Michael, Michaela Dall'Angelo, thank you for the interesting talk. Are you planning to add phylogenetic information? We would love to. Um, it's not that easy because uh, the different phylogenetic databases often have different results depending on the methods that they use and depending on the, the extent of species that they are covering. Uh, and so this information is a bit difficult to reconcile. Um, we are currently testing um, different, uh, different methods and, uh, 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 yeah, but uh, that's one of the things that we would like to add in a quite near future. 